Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, we're looking at Lincoln's Patent. In 1828, at the age of 19, Abraham Lincoln was offered a job by a wealthy Indiana landowner, James Gentry, in order to help take a flatboat full of produce and cured meat along the Mississippi to New Orleans. At $8 a month, which is a little under $200 today, it certainly wasn't a high-paying job, but it did give the teen a chance for an adventure. Prior to his trip, he had spent his entire life on farms and homesteads in Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana, knowing nothing of life beyond those borders. Gentry offered him the job simply due to happen Stamps. He owned a store of which the Lincoln family were patrons. Knowing that Abe was close to the same age as his own son, Alan, who was to captain the boat and also capable of the tasks that needed to be done, Gentry asked Abe. While very unfortunately neither Gentry nor Lincoln took notes or kept a diary during the trip, there are a few known events that happened during the voyage. For one, the small flatboat had a real problem with sandbars. When in shallow waters and weighed down by its cargo, the ship often got stuck, which meant cargo had to be unloaded to make it lighter and the craft pushed out and then reloaded. This was a tedious, hard, time-sucking, and potentially dangerous task. Another thing that's known is that the ship was attacked near Baton Rouge by a group that could be best described as river pirates. Looking for cargo and money, the ship was nearly overtaken by this group of men who had the intent of robbing and perhaps killing Lincoln and his companion if need be. Gentry and Lincoln were able to fight them off for long enough that they could cut the anchor and escape but just barely. Now, the last specific detail from this trip is the stuff of legend. Years later, Alan Gentry would continue telling the story, stating that Lincoln's future as the great emancipator was sown on that trip. According to Gentry, upon landing in New Orleans, Lincoln saw the notorious slave markets of the city and was disgusted. Supposedly, he said to Gentry at the time, Alan, this is a disgrace. If I ever get a lick at this thing, I'll hit it hard. Whether he actually said those specific words as Gentry claimed, 35 years later, he did exactly that, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed slaves from all southern territories. Three years later, in 1831, Lincoln journeyed along the Mississippi again while experiencing many of the same things he did the first time. In fact, it seems the issue with sandbars became even more pronounced, with written records stating that Lincoln and his crew lost time and cargo dealing with the matter of the ship being stuck on a sandbar. So there's a prophetic story from even before leaving Illinois in 1831, with the ship getting stuck along the Sangamon River on a dam and then taking on water. Lincoln rushed to a nearby cooper shop, a place where wooden barrels and casks were made, got an auger, drilled a hole in the side of the ship, and proceeded to let the water run out. Then he pushed the ship by himself off the dam. A year later, when running for the Illinois General Assembly from Sangamon County, one of his key platform points was improving the navigation of the river to bring more trade to the county. Said Lincoln in a 1832 speech, I believe the improvement of the Sangamon River to be vastly important and highly desirable to the people of this county. While he was defeated, in his 1832 run for political office, Lincoln was ultimately successful two years later when he was elected to the Illinois General Assembly. While he didn't achieve much in regards to improving the navigation of the river while in the General Assembly, this issue still nagged him. After two years there, he moved on to the Illinois House of Representatives and then into the U.S. Capitol as a congressman in 1847. Constantly traveling the Sangamon River and often getting stuck, this finally pushed him to do something about it. Working on an invention to solve the problem in between congressional sessions, he finally completed and submitted a patent for it days after finishing his term as a congressman. Submitted on March 10, 1849, Lincoln's patent, U.S. Patent No. 6469, was titled Boying Vessels Over Shoals, and, as you might have guessed from the title, was a patent for an improvement in order to help boats pass over sandbars by adding to, quote, adjustable buoyant air chambers to the bottom of the boat. To accompany the patent, Lincoln also created a model of his invention. Working with a Springfield mechanic, he whittled out a model of a ship with his buoying device included. Said his law partner of the time, occasionally he would bring the model into the office, and while whittling on it would descant on its merits and the revolution it was destined to work in steamboat navigation. Although I regarded the thing as impracticable, I said nothing, probably out of respect for Lincoln's well-known reputation as a boatman. Today, the model and patent application is at the National Museum of American History, but there's some dispute over exactly what the museum has in its collection. While a curator told Smithsonian Magazine in 2006 that the model is one of the half-dozen or so most 
valuable things in our collection, it is possible that what they have is in fact a replica. The nameplate on top of the model reads Abram Lincoln, a misspelling that has led some to believe that it's a fake because Lincoln would never have misspelled his own name. It is also possible that the play was added after Lincoln submitted it, but that's something that's probably never going to be known. It is possible that his signature is on the model, but it's buried under centuries of varnish. As for the patent itself, there's little doubt that this is authentic and in the handwriting of Lincoln. But there is one crucial part missing here, and that would be a signature which was likely cut out and taken by a collector who had access to the patent in the 19th century. And now for a bonus fact. The 30th President of the United States, Charles Gates Dawes, won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1925 and was a self-taught pianist and composer who composed the 1912 hit song Melody in A Major. This was eventually used in Tommy Edwards' 1958 number one hit for a then record six weeks. It's all in the game. It has since become a pop standard, having been performed and covered by artists like The Four Tops, Isaac Hayes, Van Morrison, Elton John, The Osmonds, and Barry Manilow. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got a podcast. It's called Brain Food. It's content just like this, but in the podcast form. We go into a bit more depth and really get into all of the details on a particular subject. Check it out through the links in the description below, or just search your favorite podcast app for Brain Food. And if you like this YouTube channel, I think you will really love that podcast. But if you want to watch something else right now, check out a related video from the past over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.